Our reading this evening is taken from John's Gospel, chapter 10, starting at verse 22 and reading through to the end of the chapter. Then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple area walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews gathered round him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said I am God's son? Do not believe me unless I do what my father does. But if I do it, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I in the father. Again they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. Here he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. We thank God for his word to us. The big news this week is that a vaccine has been approved and is being rolled out that will inoculate people against the worst effects of COVID-19. And uh, the Prime Minister has called this virus our invisible enemy. Uh, that's because it has caused so many people to be ill and so many people to die. In fact, uh, uh, statistically, it is uh, possible that of those who catch COVID-19, up to 3% will die of it. So it is really good news that this vaccine is between 95 and 100% effective of keeping people alive and removing the danger of death. I think that, that's really, really good. And uh, if I get the opportunity to take this vaccine, uh, I'd be willing to take it. Uh, I know some people have got doubts and worries about it, and that's okay. You must do what is right for you. But uh, I, I'm at that point where I would be willing to take it. Uh, because one of the scientists has said that this vaccine will only work if you take it, if you receive it. It is so important that when there's a cure, we receive it. The thing that comes to mind, though, is that we have an even greater invisible enemy than COVID-19, the coronavirus. And that invisible enemy that I'm talking about now is not just an ordinary virus, it's sin. And statistically speaking, Sin causes 100% of death. Every one of us will die 
And the Bible says, because we have been contaminated by sin. The good news, even better than the Pfizer vaccine, is that God has provided uh, a means of curing our sin. And it is in the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for you and for me. The Bible describes it in this language, the blood of Jesus. It means that the sacrifice of Jesus purifies us from all sin. But it is important that you receive it. That you receive Jesus as your personal Saviour and Lord. Even though the, the miracle cure, if I can use that language, was provided at the cross, it only becomes effective when we apply it to our own lives. Which is why I keep putting this prayer up almost every Sunday in our services. A prayer that invites Jesus into our lives to cleanse us from the consequences of that virus of sin. It says, Dear God, I admit I'm a sinner and need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus Christ died in my place, paying the penalty for my sins. I'm willing right now to turn from my sin and accept Jesus Christ as my personal Saviour and Lord. I commit myself to you and ask you to send the Holy Spirit into my life, to fill me and take control, and to help me become the kind of person you want me to be. Thank you, Father God, for loving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've never prayed a prayer like that before, let me encourage you to pray it. It is more important that you pray a prayer and receive Jesus than you pray, than you receive the vaccine for coronavirus. Coronavirus vaccine can extend your life only Jesus can give you eternal life. Let me encourage you, if you've never prayed a prayer like this, it doesn't have to be those words. But that prayer inviting Jesus, receiving Jesus, the, the, the cure only works if you receive it. Okay, I needed to say that. Uh, I just feel it's so important. Which leads me on to the message from the Bible that I want to give tonight. Because this coming week is the Jewish festival of Hanukkah. The festival of lights or celebration of lights. It runs from December the 10th to December the 18th. And the fascinating thing that I found in the Bible is that when Jesus was on earth, he attended the Jerusalem temple during Hanukkah. We find it in John chapter 10 and verses 22 and 23, where it says, then came the feast of dedication, which was the, the way in the, the Greek language they described the Jewish festival of Hanukkah. It came the feast then of Hanukkah at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple area walking in Solomon's colonnade. The amazing thought is that in the middle of the festival of lights stood the light of the world, Jesus Christ. Some people would have recognized and received his light, while others were to reject it. Do you enjoy the Christmas lights? I, I like driving around sometimes in, in the evenings now when it's dark and you can see the decorations that people have put all over the front of their houses or sometimes shining out through their front window, uh, their Christmas tree or some other lights. And sometimes you see the ones with the candles. Many of, of these lights, their origin is in the Jewish festival of lights, Hanukkah, particularly the candles. That's where it comes from. And Christians and others have borrowed this imagery and reinterpreted it for the Christian faith. And it's lovely sometimes when you're driving around, you see those lights, that warm glow on a dark night. 
as Christians, it should cause us to remember that Jesus Christ is the light of the world, that he brought that warm glow of God's love and the opportunity to have forgiveness and eternal life into our world of sin and darkness and despair. So I want to look at Jesus in the context of Hanukkah and this festival of lights. And as we look at John chapter 10, verses 22 to 25, if you want to follow it in your Bible, I want us to think about three things. The history, the mystery, and the victory. That's simple enough, isn't it? And uh, now you'll be able to work your way with me through the sermon and know when we get to the end, which is always the bit that many people look forward to. First of all, the history. And uh, when you look at the, the scriptures, it says that at this festival, it was winter. Jesus was in the temple area, walking in one particular part of the temple, Solomon's colonnade. And what we have here is an eyewitness account. Remember, the Bible is a reliable book. John, who writes this, was probably there. So the details he gives are specific and precise. He tells us exactly where Jesus was in the temple. Solomon's colonnade was here on the eastern side of the temple. And Jesus and many others would enter in from the Mount of Olives. Uh, that was the royal portico that uh, King Herod built later. Solomon's colonnade was here. And uh, there would have been lights, uh, candles celebrating Hanukkah as they went into the inner courts to make the sacrifices. Uh, and that was the actual shrine of the temple in the middle for those of you who are interested. And the history of this and the background of this is that 170 years before Jesus was born, 170 BC, there was a culture war among the Jewish people between those who wanted the Jews to become like the Greek culture and those who wanted them to stay with the laws of the Bible. And because there was this falling out among the people of Jerusalem, those who wanted the Greek culture invited the king of Syria to come and help them to uh, turn Israel into just another kind of ancient Greek type nation. This king's name was Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And he makes modern day rulers look kind of, you know, uh, uh, gentle uh, and peaceful. He was a real bit of a, uh, of a nutcase, of a strong man. That last part of his name, Epiphanes, uh, is Greek for a God made manifest among us. Uh, if you can imagine uh, a recent American prime minister, uh, uh, not prime minister, what is it, president, uh, seems to have had a big opinion of himself. This Antiochus IV had an even bigger opinion of himself. Uh, he was, in fact, a little bit like an antichrist, which is something that we will see in the future, says the Bible. Because when he came into Jerusalem, he took over. And in the temple courts, he removed the altar where they would have their kind of barbecue uh, in honor of God. And placed instead of the Jewish altar to the living God, an altar to Zeus, and then he sacrificed a pig on it. You know what the Jews think of that, don't you? Or they won't even eat a, a nice bacon sandwich today. So there was a, a rebellion and a riot against this. And a group of Jewish men uh, from the family of the Maccabees. Have you heard of the, the Maccabean rebellion, some of you? I'm giving you the history and the background so you can get the, the context of this. Uh, the Maccabees rose up against this Antiochus IV Epiphanes and the, the Greek culture Jews, and they fought a war starting in 167 BC until they recaptured Jerusalem in 164 BC and reestablished Jewish biblical worship in the temple courts again. 
One of the, the famous issues that they had was that the Jews had a big candle inside the shrine called a menorah. Have you ever heard of that? Uh, it's had seven branches on it, and it was fed by oil. It was an oil-based candle, a, a candelabra. Uh, and they were running out of uh, holy oil. They only had enough for one day, but they say that miraculously it lasted for eight days until they were able to purify fresh oil for their menorah. So to celebrate that, they created a nine-branch candelabra, which is what you often see in windows of Jewish people for Hanukkah. And you might see in coming days. I know Christians sometimes have it as well now, uh, but for the Jews, there were nine candles. And the one in the middle was called the steward, uh, and they would light a candle every day for eight days through Hanukkah as part of this celebration. So on the first day, the, the center candle and one other. The second day, two. The third day, three. The fourth day, four. Until the eight days were over to celebrate God's light coming into their nation again as they rededicated the temple. And this is background that we need to know because when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, it is in this context an understanding of the people who are listening. He says, I am the light. I'm the, the, the steward. I'm the, the main candle from which everyone else gets their light. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. And I'm so sad this year we can't have our normal Christmas uh, candlelight service. Uh, because what we often do there, isn't it? We, we light one candle first, the Jesus candle. And we take this imagery. And then from that one candle, we light all our other candles to say it is from Jesus that we get our light. We've borrowed this from the Jews, okay? Uh, and just reinterpreted it in a Christian context. So, Jesus is the light of the world. And as we receive our light from him, we are to share and shine and reflect his light to others. And we have great opportunities to do that now in this dark time, not only physically dark, but emotionally dark and spiritually dark in our nation. When people are looking for hope, are looking for some warm glow that will cheer them in a very difficult and challenging time. So let me encourage you, if you've received the light of Jesus' love in your own life, to share it with someone else. Come and help us sometime on the, the Saturday, uh, the two Saturdays before Christmas, when we're down in the town. Take one of the posters and put it up in your window and shine the light of God's love and truth into our dark world today. We have a light and a hope and a joy and a peace and a faith that our world needs. Okay, so that's the history. Let me take you further on and talk about the mystery. Because as Jesus was there at Hanukkah, saying things like, I am the light of the world, the Jews gathered around him and said, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Suspense. Mystery. Who is it you think you are, Jesus? Some of them were looking for an excuse to persecute him. Others may have been actually warmed by their engagement with him. If you are the Christ, what does Christ mean? It is the, the special name of God's servant to bring salvation to his people. Christ, Messiah, special one. If you're this special one, this anointed one, tell us plainly. And Jesus replies to them in this way. I, tell, I did tell you, but you do not believe. When did Jesus tell them? Well, many occasions. 
every time he said things like, I am the light of the world, he was telling them. When he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the vine. You are the branches. In all of these ways, Jesus was trying to tell them who he was, not just an ordinary man, but the Son of God. God the Son, come to earth in human form as the Messiah, as our Savior, to bring us God's love and forgiveness. But many people were unwilling to accept it. If you look back just a few pages in your Bible to John chapter 8, and it's John 8 verse 12 where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. At the end of that chapter in verses 58 and 59, it says this, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Now those words, just those two little words, I am, were very significant to the Jewish people. Because in Exodus chapter 3, verses 13, 14, when Moses was at the burning bush, and he said to God, I don't want to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Because they're going to say, who are you? I need to know who you are, God, so that I can tell them you've sent me. And God says to Moses, tell them, I am has sent you. And your Jesus is saying, even before Moses was ever born, I am. It is a claim to be God the Son, the Son of God. And every time he said, I am, the light of the world, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, the life. He was telling them exactly who he was. But here in John chapter 8, they picked up stones to, to stone him. And in John chapter 10, uh, if you read on in that chapter, as we did in our reading earlier, you'll see the same again, because they accused him of blasphemy. They wouldn't receive it. It's so important, isn't there? If there's a cure, you receive it. And they wouldn't receive it. They refused. Many Jewish people still do particularly struggle with recognizing and accepting Jesus Christ. But not all. And more and more are coming to faith in Jesus all the time. One of the charities I support is called Jews for Jesus. And in their latest magazine, it tells the story of Rachel. Rachel is a Jewish woman in America, in New York. And she met some messianic Jews, Jewish people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And as she was speaking to them, she was challenged and went away and started to do some studies. And she said to one of them, let me get her, her words correct here. If you want to borrow the magazine afterwards, uh, come and see me. She said, her heart was in tumult because she was afraid Jesus might be the Messiah. But she talked to a Christian Jewish man called Kirk, who took her to the Old Testament, to the Jewish prophet Isaiah, chapter 53, and read through it with her. And you can't read Isaiah 53 without recognizing Jesus there. It's all about, it's a prophecy 700 years before Jesus was born, of his death on the cross to bring salvation to God's people she says, I'm overcome. I'm one of the lost sheep. With further conversations with Kirk and others, she began to read and study the Bible and uh, compare the, the prophecies of the Messiah in the Old Testament with the history of Jesus in the New. After which, she prayed to receive Jesus as a saviour and Lord. Notice that word receive. It is so important. At the beginning of John's gospel, John chapter 1 and verse 12, the Bible tells us all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. Let me ask you that question. Have you received Jesus as your Savior? Have you taken in 
him into your heart, into your mind, into your life, and made him your Lord and your Savior. If you haven't, I encourage you to do so. It is more important that you receive Jesus than it is that you receive the vaccine for coronavirus. Coronavirus may preserve your life, but only Jesus can give you eternal life. Have you received Jesus? If you haven't, do it tonight. You could just close your eyes and say, God, forgive me. Come into my life. I'm going to listen to what Jesus says. I'm going to follow his example. I'm going to follow his teaching. I'm trusting in him. I know I'm not good enough, but he died to save me. Pray a prayer like that. It doesn't have to be the, the right words. It's the heart that matters. That reaching out to receive the forgiveness that God gives to you and to me. And if you have received Jesus, share him with others. Our world needs this cure more than the Pfizer vaccine. Our world needs Jesus. So we've looked at the history. We've looked at the mystery. Let me tell you about the victory. As Jesus is saying these things to the people in Hanukkah, uh, many of them might have had quizzical looks on their faces or maybe even anger or rejection. And Jesus says, look, if you're not sure that I am who I say I am, because anybody can say that they're a son of God, they're the Messiah, uh, many fools have done so over the centuries. Jesus gives proof. And the proof he gives is this, the miracles that I do in my Father's name speak for me. The healing of the lame and the sick the death, the turning the water into wine, the stilling the storm, the feeding the 5,000. There was something uniquely special about our Savior, Jesus Christ. It was lovely in church this morning uh, when we opened up the response time. Somebody shared that they'd had a healing in response to prayer, that they'd had pain in their neck for, for, for months and months. And after prayer, for the last three weeks, that pain is gone. Hallelujah. Our God is real. He still heals. Why he doesn't heal everybody? Well, that's his will, not ours. But God still does miracles, and they happen. And the greatest miracle of all, the greatest proof that Jesus is the Messiah, is the resurrection. The resurrection. Because it is through the resurrection that we see the power of death and hell and sin is overcome and broken. That there is life beyond death through faith in Jesus. When our boys were little, uh, I remember one birthday, we bought one of them, his birthday cake, and just for fun, we put these magic candles on it. Did you ever do that with your kids? Uh, the ones where when you blow them out, what happens? They relight. Uh, and you know what it's like when the kids are small, they're supposed to make a wish. Or if you're a Christian, you know, super spiritual, uh, say a prayer. <laughs> so uh, we're saying to, to, to our son, you know, blow the candles out and then you can uh, you know, make your wish and we, you know, we get you your birthday presents. And he blew them out and they all came back again. Uh, we were just having a bit of fun. Oh, I'm cruel, aren't I? So you're thinking, oh, Martin, he's cruel. But we, we explained but it was just a bit of fun, and uh, they, they got used to it. But listen, uh, the darkness of sin and of evil tried to put out the light of the world, Jesus Christ, at the cross. But his light could not be extinguished. Do you get the point? So the Bible tells us, it's in Luke chapter 23 and verse 44, for three hours there was darkness over the world when Jesus died on the cross. The darkness tried to put out the light. But as it says in John chapter 1, verse 3, the darkness can't comprehend and it can't overcome the light. And Jesus rose again. The greatest proof of who Jesus is is that he is alive. Every other religious leader... Every other founder of every other religion is dead and they can take you to the place where they were buried, but there is an empty tomb for Christianity. Our Lord 
is alive. And he's at work. Darkness cannot put out that light. It's tremendous news that there's a vaccine for coronavirus, but there is greater news. There is a cure for sin. The worst invisible enemy can be overcome through faith in Jesus Christ. He is the light of the world. And when you see the Christmas lights out and about, let it remind you of Jesus. Let it remind you of God's love. So what? Have you received the cure for sin? Have you received the light and love of God in your heart and in your mind? If not, please do so. Reach out to him. Receive his forgiveness. And if you have, please share it. Please tell someone else about Jesus this Christmas. Let his light guide you away from darkness. So let's come to God in prayer. Almighty God, may the light of Jesus shine brightly in us and through us this Christmas. Amen.